Welcome to the Smarter Science of Slim, the scientifically proven program where you eat more and exercise less to burn fat and boost health. Eat smarter, exercise smarter, live better. I am so ready for that. Hey, everybody, Jonathan Baylor back with another bonus Smarter Science of Slim show. And it is sunny here in Seattle, which is shocking. So we're recording this two days before Christmas, and it's just like freaking sunny. And it's also sunny inside because I am speaking with one of my dear friends and one of the sunniest individuals I have the pleasure of spending time with. He is a, a luminary and a luminescence because we're talking about sun and light individual in the wellness community. He recently actually broke iTunes. He had not only the number one rated show on iTunes, but also simultaneously the number five rated show while having like number one and five in the app store. And I like, it was like Eminem when eight mile came out where he had like the number one album and the number ones. He's like the Eminem. That's the bottom line. He is the luminescent Eminem of the health and wellness community. And his name is Abel James. Abel, what's up, brother? Jonathan, I think that's my favorite intro of all time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, you know, you're welcome to use that on your bio if you want. I, it's all good. The Eminem of iTunes. The, the, the luminescent Eminem <clears throat> of iTunes. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, folks, as you can tell, uh, Abel's a, a great dude. He's a, he's a buddy of mine. And, and I wanted to share with you today, actually, Abel and I had the unique opportunity to spend two days together recently and and it, w it was a lot of fun wasn't it Abel two days straight no less yeah it was it was a blast we um <laughs> were running on fumes at that point but it was it was so much fun and Jonathan uh I was really excited to film with you in particular because I think you have such a balanced approach to all of this you definitely have all of the the knowledge and the research but you also approach this from uh, a, a really cool communication standpoint where I think you can distill these crazy and, and, and sometimes dichotomous subjects and distill them down to something that, that most people can understand. Oh, well, thank you so much, Abel. I, I appreciate that. And one of the things that I loved most about our time together, and, and just the reason I wanted to have you back on the show, one of many, is during our time together, we're talking about like, you know, Abel, you're, you're having all this amazing success and you're changing all these lives. But even in our time together, it was like, you know, is, is Abel paleo? Is Abel this? Is Abel that? Like, no, he's Abel James, and he's about helping people to live better. But can you tell us a little bit, like, that's not easy. It's not easy to not put yourself, like, to label yourself and to put yourself with a camp. So, so how, do you, how do you do that? How do you keep the energy up to do that and to really be your own person, staying focused on, on the ends rather than the means? I think it's all about the process. It's, it's not about this, this wild intervention that you do with yourself from time to time going 100% paleo and then cheating a while and then, you know, trying another version of a similar diet or, you know, like following another guru in the same space and, and doing what they say to do with, which is probably eating beans on only Tuesdays or something crazy like that. It's all about finding peace within your own process. Uh, and understanding the diet that that works best for you. And Jonathan, we talked about this a, a lot uh, when you were at the house in terms of what you're eating every day. That's different from what I'm eating every day, not just because of, uh, you know, a, a difference in philosophy necessarily or at all, but because we like different things. We um, we travel in a slightly different way to different places and we have um completely unique favorite foods and dislikes of food. So it's all about taking all of these crazy variables and trying to come up with something that works really, really well for your own lifestyle, health, and happiness. I love that radical, and it's not even a really radical customization. It's, let's call it common sense customization. I, mm -hmm. I mean, there is no one outfit that looks best on everyone that they should wear all the time. Like it totally depends on circumstance. And I love what you said too about this not doing this extreme diet for six days and then having to do something else some other day. And I think you uh, and, and Allison really embodied that because 
you, it just, it seemed like you had achieved what I refer to as nutritional serenity, where you just eat. Like you just eat. It's not like there's this thing as a cheat day because there's no need to cheat because what you're doing doesn't feel like a deprivation. Yeah. So you just, you're just living your life and you're focused on living your life rather than like monitoring and counting and blah, 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 what you're putting in your mouth. That's absolutely true. It's, uh, it's amazing how easy this all is. Once you get the hang of it, let me just say that once you get the hang of it, it's very, very easy. So you don't have to count anything. You don't have to think about the types of food that you're eating. It's just like, am I hungry right now? Kind of take your own temperature and see how you feel. And some days, you know, that, that means that uh, either I will be fasting or, or Allison will be fasting at some point. We're kind of going back and forth um, day to day on that. It's every meal is different, but they follow the same guidelines. So once you know what those guidelines are, you can get really creative uh, and, and quite indulgent, indulgent with what you're eating. Um, I think as evidenced by when we went out to eat, Jonathan, we ordered, I don't know, like a dozen things and just shared them all around. And you ordered, I, th I think, a whole pig, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it could have been. I, I would neither confirm nor deny that statement. <laughs> no, it's true, Abel. And do you think there's, I think maybe some of the reason there might be, confusion might be the wrong word, but do you, do you think there's a difference, a difference in your approach to eating and exercise? Because there's, there's two distinct goals. There's a goal of looking like a, a, a fit individual, not becoming diabetic. Let's call that goal A. And then there's goal B, which is like being sh a shredded athlete on a CrossFit <laughs> commercial. Is there, are, are, those are, it seems like those are two different goals. What would you change about the way you eat or how you exercise dependent on those goals? It changes a lot. Because those goals can work very much against each other. You know, the performance goal can completely be at odds with the appearance goal. And you'd, you'd think that they would go together. And oftentimes they do, generally speaking. But when you're talking about vascularity and getting down to a super low body fat, usually the way that that happens is by sacrificing performance to some degree because you're exercising restriction uh, in, in favor of trying to lose extra body fat. Whereas if you want to totally crush it at the gym, then uh, carving up can be really useful. Um, being totally ketogenic can make you a little foggy. I mean, there are different ways to do it, but they're kind of competing goals. And, and I can tell you, one of the most interesting things about all that, Jonathan, is that once you understand the guidelines there, I've been in both situations, been in just you know completely shredded, ripped, incredible shape, and also um, been in not that great of shape in terms of conditioning anyway, just doing like the bare minimum of exercise. Um, and that's where I am right now. But the difference in terms of what you look like in the mirror um, can be somewhat negligible, which is really interesting. I, I you know, measure myself sometimes after not binging for, for two weeks, but certainly indulging in a lot of ways. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm traveling internationally, eating cultural foods, for example, um, and just <laughs> seeing that it doesn't make that big of an impact on my body uh, is, is really interesting because you can fiddle with, and, and with all those little things and turn all those little knobs. But once you know the, the basics of how your body's operating, you can, uh, you can indulge, indulge a lot more than you ever thought possible. I, I love the point about they're very different goals and they require very different approaches because I think one one thing that sometimes we can lose sight of which which causes a lot of confusion is even when you look at these like super shredded fitness competitors that's that's like game time for them they have an off season they're not like that right. all the time and even even athletes right there's always an off season and the reason there's an off season is what they're doing by definition isn't sustainable yeah. And when you and I are talking about, about our, our approaches, I think usually we're, we're biasing towards sustainability. That's and, right. And that, that is different, right? Like a, a, the way you get to 3% body fat is not a sustainable approach because that's not healthy. You're not supposed to have 3% body fat. So what, what have you seen to be some of the biggest dietary differences between when people are sort of uh, going for this very specific short-term goal versus the state of nutritional serenity? That is a great question and, and one that I think most people don't think about enough. But I've, I've really been on both sides of that. You know, I've run marathons um, 
often, you know, 50 plus miles a week for a while. I was, I was doing that and I could get away with eating almost anything because of the sheer amount of effort I was, I was putting out and my particular body type makes it so that uh, it just kind of burns all of the muscle off of me and I can burn a lot of carbs that way. Um, and, and you can get fast, but you're also, uh, you're kind of drawing a debt from your body's own perspective. Yes, you can be performing at a high level, but at the same time, you're, you're aging more quickly and you're um, risking injury and especially repetitive type injuries. You can be burning up your joints. So a lot of the people who are super high performers, uh, especially at a younger age, are certainly not later in life. So you're, you're drawing that debt. And if you draw too much, at all of a sudden you're looking at the average lifespan of an NFL player, for instance, being like 51 years old, despite them being in incredible shape for the majority of their lives, you're, you're burning through um, all sorts of different things, some that we can measure and some that we can't. Uh, and so it's all about finding that balance. And I think a lot of people want to be, you know, they, they assume that if you look fit, then you have to have that sort of dedication to exercising three hours a day and being a high performance athlete. But actually that's not the case. Most of us used to be quite slim and, and beautiful just naturally because that's what our bodies want to be. And so when you learn how to eat effectively um, and especially eating effectively for that lifestyle, which tends to be uh, lowish carb compared to someone who's do doing high performance training, once you understand that uh, it can be pretty easy to do it for a lifetime. And when you want to scale that performance back up, you know, if I'm going to do eight hours of Krav, Krav Maga tomorrow, then you bet I'm going to be eating a couple of sweet potatoes. But because I haven't really been exercising in a few weeks, to be quite honest, uh, I'm certainly not carving it up right now. I know some listeners heard, are hearing this, it's easy, it's easy sentiment, and it may have some question marks popping into their head. But you made a point there that I think we don't hear enough, which is the default state, like the, the, the earliest data we have is from the early 1900s around obesity rates. It comes from the military and they were sub 3%. And like wow. any time we, we, if you just like look back in, in history, actually the, the obesity and being overweight was just like this, it just didn't really exist. So, mm -hmm. so it is, it is not the default state, but what what I think we find ourselves in, Abel, and I'm curious as to how, how we can get out of this, is like it's not hard to not get lung cancer. Just don't smoke. However, if you lived in America in the early 1900s when everybody smoked everywhere, then even if you chose not to smoke, you were subjected to secondhand smoke. Like it's easy to not get lung cancer, yeah. but it's really hard to not get lung cancer if you live in a culture where you are just inundated with it at every turn. Right. <laughs> That's a really good point. And, but, but like you said, the natural state is to be healthy. And so in a healthy body, you can really get away with, with quite a lot. Um, like humans always did, you know, you could indulge, you could find a whole pot of honey and probably eat the whole thing. And it's not that big of a deal aside from taking a nap after a big sugar crash after that. <laughs> but what we find today is that so many of us are fundamentally broken uh, in, the, in the vast majority of people who are overweight or obese, um, it, it's not that they're fat that's making them sick. It's they get sick first and then the fat is a side effect of that. So what we're looking at are people who are broken metabolically. And I think you've described this very well in, in your book uh, and in your podcast as well. But that's that's really what we're talking about here is that people, if you if you're eating the way that humans have always been eating, at least mostly for the majority of your life, none of this stuff is really an issue. You just being fat won't be a problem because you don't get fat, right? Like you won't have to lose weight. That's an unnatural state of, of being in a place where you need to lose weight to be healthy. And unfortunately, that's where we find most of us today. And this, this idea, Abel, about really getting dialed into what is and isn't normal, I think is key because for, for a lot of us, we've got a lot of stuff going on in our lives, right? It's just like, I have enough to worry about. And if, if you can kind of understand that you are not defective by default and that normal, like it's not normal to be hungry. It, it, calories are not something to be avoided. Like 
fat doesn't make you fat. Fat makes you full. And even if you do indulge, like we were talking about this, where you ate some whole pumpkin loaf or something like that. And, yeah. and, and it's not like your body is dumb. Your body is like, oh my God, I just ate 2000 calories. <laughs> You're going to be really full for a really long time. Your body isn't stupid, right? Yeah. Well, unless you're doing things to trick it and break it. So if you eat uh, 2,000 calories of Oreos, you probably might, or, or you go and get Chinese food, right? The junky flash fried Chinese food that's, that's mostly fried rice or whatever from college. You're definitely hungry an hour later, but it's not because you didn't eat enough. It's because your body is totally jacked up now as a direct result of, of consuming MSG and mostly high glycemic carbs, which just... Uh, affects your brain in all sorts of negative ways. But isn't that in and of itself, Abel, like that point you just made about how you can eat, you can eat food and not be satisfied. Like that in and of itself just seems so crazy. I mean, like the whole point of food, like the reason we eat is to, to fulfill a need. But what we're eating today is not only not fulfilling that need, but in many cases, it's making it worse. Like it's making us hungrier. Yeah. And what people are doing is they're paying more to get on purpose less food. So when you look at those like 100 calorie packs, I mean, it's, it's every marketer's dream or every supply chain manager or what have you, because it's um, you're, you're aiming if you're following this whole calorie type deal. What you're aiming to do is get less and less food for the same price or sometimes even even more. What? What we recommend is the exact opposite of that. If you're going to eat something, it should fill you up. That's that's the whole point of eating food. You're not eating food uh, and, and trying to get nothing from it. It's it's such a bizarre concept that I think a lot of people haven't really stared down in the face yet because it's not glaringly obvious. But but man, when you take a step back and you look at what most people are doing, it's it's pretty sad. You're getting less and less food on purpose because supposedly that's supposed to keep you slim in, in some way or another. Well, and to your point earlier, Abel, about it's you're building up this debt with some of this, this physical approach you could take, or you're also, you're building up a debt, not only just from a hunger perspective. I mean, you can't, you can't just not sleep. Like that is going yeah. to catch up with you. You can't just not go to the bathroom. It's going to catch up with you. You can't just not eat. It will catch up with you. But we, we, we often also forget of the emotional aspects. Like there's so much, and you, you cover this so well, there's so much of an emotional side to eating and to continuously be racking up the debt of not, there's a reason foods taste good. I mean, like it, it seems like we're going to talk about like default states. It seems like uh, feeling full and enjoying eating is the default state of a human. But what are we told to do today is to like, fear food and to constantly be hungry. That's ridiculous. And trick your body by eating food, right? There's this, um, there's this undercurrent of trying to confuse your body into being able to have your cake and eat it too. I would argue though, uh, that, that we need to simplify a bit more and just look back to some of the generations that came before us. It was you part of, of being sati satiated, Part of being full at the end of a meal was having experienced that meal. It's taking the time to savor. If you're going to eat a little piece of chocolate, then you shouldn't just scarf it down, you know, like, like a dog might. <laughs> you should enjoy every, every bit of that. And in that enjoyment, you're actually telling your brain that this is incredible. This is nutrient dense. This is something that you love. And it, it, tends to fill you up much more quickly if you are taking the time to acknowledge that what you're eating is delicious, which most of the time, or hopefully all of the time, it is. Abel, that is, it's spot on from a common sense perspective, and it's also been proven from a scientific perspective. There's been these really cool studies done where they would take uh, soup and, and uh, pastries or just various types of things, and they would present participants with a version which, which the, the, the fat or the savory element was visible. So like, and then they provided people with a, a version of that same food, again, I, isocaloric, meaning they had the same number of calories, mm -hmm. but one didn't look decadent and the other one looked decadent. And wow. consistently, the one that looked decadent 
people felt more satiated. They sometimes didn't even finish it because they were like, oh, I could only eat half of that. But when it looked, and when you think about our culture, like some of these most toxic substances, they don't even look good. They look like right. garbage. Yeah. I mean, just look at like a, a tray of nachos. <laughs> that, that looks the same way coming up as it does going down and vice versa. It's, it's not a real pretty picture. No, I love that. I, and I love, I love the idea of, of savoring your foods and, and feeling conscious. Well, Abel, you, you mentioned to me before the show that you, you celebrated your holiday a little bit early this year. And I'm curious, how did you navigate the, the dietary landscape over the holidays, because that can, that can sometimes get a little dicey. We made lots of sweets ourselves. That's the real trick because you, you can have your cake and eat it too if you make the cake. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, unfortunately, you're surrounded by so many sweets. But I've been doing this, this for long enough that they don't taste good um, anymore. For the most part, they're, they're just too sweet. And after you've experienced that enough times, uh, it doesn't really look like food anymore. So it, if I see a, a cake that's, or a cookie that's covered in frosting, it doesn't look appealing. It certainly used to. I would, I would go right for it. I would eat the whole pie or whatever. But um, now my body has, has learned to associate it with sugar crashes. And you know, if, if you go from eating really, really high quality food to eating something that's a complete sugar bomb and full of gluten and other junk, uh, you can feel it almost immediately and you feel terrible. So it's become um, relatively straightforward to navigate it. But the, the easiest way to get through is last night, for example, I cooked up another like chocolate pumpkin loaf and I didn't <laughs> eat the whole thing, but I did eat um, quite a bit of it. And it's wonderful. You can make, I made myself a, uh, a fatty coffee with peppermint. So it's kind of like a, a homemade frappuccino type, type thing. Um, but I made it with things that are safe and not going to um, give you a, a sugar high and a crash. So if you make these foods through the holidays, if you take, you know, it doesn't have to be a huge effort either. I'm a guy and I usually don't like to spend loads of time in the kitchen like Allison might. Um, so I like to get in and out and you can make an amazing dessert for in, in five or 10 minutes. So making that little bit of effort ensures that um, not only do you get to eat your, uh, your desserts throughout the holidays, but they're not doing any sort of damage uh, that a lot of those other foods would be doing to you if you, you know, ate every rum ball that you saw at the parties <laughs> and, and ate that stale fruitcake or whatever. So if you can avoid um, just a little bit of that and fill yourself up on your own delicious food, preferably, then uh, it, it makes the holidays a breeze. It's cool too, Abel. I know people have the experience where they'll they'll prepare some of these amazing recipes that you and Allison provide, and and then when they do bring them to holiday gatherings or just social gatherings in general, if they don't say anything, people are like, "Oh, this is you know so good," and and then you're like, "Well, <laughs> now you know. Here's the secret." <laughs> yeah, and that can backfire too. I remember Allison was serving uh, one of her desserts to a bunch of teenagers, and. As they were eating it, she mentioned that there was zucchini in it because it was like a cobbler and it tasted like apple. It was amazingly good. But she said, oh, yeah, there are vegetables in there. And they're like, oh, this is gross now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. That's so funny. Oh, man. Hey, well, it's, you know, it's always a joy. I'm delighted you had a wonderful holiday. It was awesome spending some time together. And what, what, is, what is next for you in the, in the fat-burning dynasty? Yeah. So um, – Obviously, you can find me at fatburningman.com, and that's the name of my show as well. Uh, we just launched Fat Burning Chef, which is uh, basically the, the top cooks and friends and bloggers in paleo and beyond get together and uh, put all of our favorite recipes in one place. So that's at fatburningchef.com. And then, Jonathan, um, we have that epic, epically new school fat loss masterclass, which is basically eight plus hours of, of video explaining how you can live uh, your life and be lean and happy forever. It is possible. <laughs> and um, I, I'm really excited about it because it's something that's so new and so different. And uh, as you well know, Jonathan, we're getting into video a lot more in 2014. And I can't wait to hear what people think of Fat Loss Masterclass. I love it. So just give us the, both those URLs one more time, Abel. All right. So 
I'm at fatburningman.com and you can certainly find everything through there. And fatlossmasterclass.com is where you can find uh, the, the video course, the home study course with Jonathan and myself. I love it. Well, Abel, it is always a pleasure. I wish you all the best in 2014. It will certainly be an epic year. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Have a good one, brother. You too. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed this wonderful conversation as much as I did. Again, our guest is the amazing Abel James, which if you're one of the five people that don't subscribe to his podcast on iTunes, <laughs> go ahead and check it out because it is wonderful. And then, of course, he and I are collaborating on this cool thing called Fat Loss Masterclass, which you can check out online as well. And remember, this week and every week after, eat smarter, exercise smarter, and live better. Ciao with you soon. Wait, wait, don't stop listening yet. You can get fabulous free same recipes over at carrybrown.com. And don't forget your 100% free eating and exercise quick start program, as well as free, fun, daily tips delivered right into your inbox at baylorgroup.com. That's B-A-I-L-O-R group.com.